Some of the worst things that has happened to people has happened because of family. Is it possible that family drama can actually ruin a person's legacy? Find out next on Words to Inspire You. Restoration Christian Ministries presents Words to Inspire You. A time for sharing the things that will bring encouragement to your hearts and enlightenment to your minds. Inspirational words to keep you focused on the things of the kingdom of God and his Christ. Join us now and enjoy Words to Inspire You with your host, Pastor John Bazemore. Hello, everyone. This is Pastor B, and I welcome you again to Words to Inspire You. Well, this is the day the Lord has made. We are going to rejoice, and we are going to be glad in it. For the past few weeks, I've been talking about things relating to family, and I really want to continue that this week. But I want to go in a little different direction this week. I want to talk about more of family as it comes to family turmoil and family drama and the things that can happen in family if we fail to make the right decisions as well as fail to live the right type of life in front of our family members, our children, our siblings, whoever it may be. And I want to start that out by talking about a family that we're all familiar with. Uh, they, they're mentioned in the Bible. But I, I may want to give a little different spin on it. Now, the first family that I want to talk about. Now, I'm going to I really want to talk about David. So let me say that from the beginning. But I want to preface that by uh, talking about a couple of families that will give you an idea of how family um, uh, interactions can make a difference in people's legacy. If you look at Genesis chapter 37, the story of uh, Joseph and how he interacted with his father and his brothers, it gives you a real indication of how sometimes family drama can start at the top, and if it's not, um, and if it's not intervened, and if there's not intervention between the mother, the father, the children, whomever it may be, then that thing can go on from generation to generation. So if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 37, I'm going to start at verse verse three, and listen to what it says. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream. And he told it to his brother, brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Now, I want you to see the family dynamic that's going on here. Now, let's just cut right to the chase. Joseph actually, I mean, Jacob actually loved Rachel. And for seven years, he worked so that he could get her hand in marriage. So this is the one that he wanted. He made no bones about it. Everybody knew it. Everybody uh, in that family, in both families knew it. So he, he didn't make any bones about it, but he was tricked by his father-in-law into marrying the other sister. So what really happened, um, she was covered up. He really thought he was sleeping with Rachel because he hadn't slept with her before. So he really thought he was sleeping with Rachel. He ended up sleep, sleeping with Leah. And so, of course, because he, you know, bedded her, then he had to end up uh, being with her and marrying her. Now, it wasn't that he wasn't, uh, of course, physically attracted to her at all, because he did end up having children with her. But that was not his choice. And see, all of this, all of this could have been eliminated if people would just tell the truth. And that's a big thing when you're dealing with family turmoil and family drama. Most of that is, is related somehow to somebody not telling the truth somewhere. So Joseph, had, so Jacob, again, had to end up working seven more years to get the person that he wanted. Now, in the interim, he had children with Leah. He had children with the maid of Leah. He, and then eventually he had children with the maid of uh, Rachel. And eventually, towards the end of his life, he finally had two children with Rachel. But now, here's the thing. The problem was not that um, Jacob loved uh, Joseph more than all the others. The problem was that the children thought Jacob loved them less. Now, do you see the drama here? You know, it's, it's something, and you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know what children are, are saying, and you know how 
uh, cruel children can be. You don't know what's being said. You don't know the conversations that the children are hearing where the parents don't know. And let me say this. If you think kids don't understand you talking codes, you are kidding yourself. Children are a lot smarter these days than they used to be. And the example that you set um, in front of your children, the things that you say will determine not only your legacy, but the legacy of your whole family. Now imagine that you choose, you, you decide there is somebody that you love more than someone else, but you end up marrying somebody else. You have children with them, and then you finally end up with the one that you really want, and you have children with them. Now you have what is called a blended family. And that's a situation that you have to you have to really be very careful about. Now, uh, you know, I want to mention someone else. You know, we, we know the story of Joseph and how that worked out. But now the problem, again, with that was that Jacob, yes, he loved um, he loved Joseph more because he loved his mother more. So quite naturally, it shouldn't have been. And let me say, let me not say quite naturally, because it really shouldn't be that way. It's not the children's fault that the parent. And see, this stuff always starts at the top. And if you don't get to the root of what a real a problem is, you would never be able to resolve that situation. And the root of that problem was not Joseph. The root of that problem was his father. His father showing deference over their children. And that's that's not something you should do. And that's not something that will build the type of oneness, you know, when you're trying to establish a family. And trust me, I'm not just giving you biblical information. I know what this kind of situation is all about because I was a part of that same type of situation myself. So I know what it's like to have yours, mine's, and ours. And if you don't handle that situation the right way, then somehow somebody in that family is going to end up feeling less love because you just didn't handle that situation the right way. Now, it's always always best you know, to, to marry and have children with that one person, but it does not always work out that way. Sometimes you end up in a situation where you have, you know, yours and mine's or yours, mine's and ours, and you have to handle that situation in a way that everyone in that family feels wanted and everyone in that family feels a part of it. Now, when I got married, I had two sons. Um, my previous wife that passed, uh, Jan had one daughter, Janelle, and I had two sons. But now it was my job and Jan's job to make everybody feel welcome. And then I ended up having two children with Jan. So now not only did we have different children, there were other women involved. So now you've got to handle that situation very delicately. I made sure that my children never heard me talking negatively about the mother that I was no longer married to. I made sure that that happened because here's the thing. It's not the children's fault that they end up in a situation where they are part of a divorce or they're part of, um, in Jan's situation, her husband passed. You know, I got divorced from my first wife and it was nothing. Listen, I was, I was 19 years old when, my, uh, when I conceived my first child. So I knew nothing at all about being a father. You know, I do not blame it on my previous uh, marriage. I don't blame it on her at all. She's a wonderful woman. We get along absolutely great right now, but that took a lot of work. And if you are not willing to put in the work, then you could have family drama that could destroy your whole family. Look at Jesus. Now in the book of John, and let me read it to you. In the book of John, chapter seven, it, it shows you the, the drama that was going on in the family of Jesus. Let me read it to you. John seven, verse three, it says this. His brothers, or let me say, his brothers therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that they that your disciples may also see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeking seek to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Now listen to verse 5. For neither did his brothers believe in him. Now imagine this. You have an older brother who is the head of the household head of the carpentry business, and he's walking around now telling people, he's 30 years old, he went into ministry, and now he's walking around telling people he's the son of God. Not good for family business. As well, you had a situation where their mother was accused of, a, of being an adulteress, of, of actually having an illegitimate child. So now that's a lot of drama for a family to be dealing with. And were, were it not for Jesus handling that thing the right way, it could have messed up everything. But now again, you've got to learn to handle situations the right way. And that leads me to David. You know, 
a lot of times I, I used to wonder, you know, when you read, um, I think it's First Samuel chapter 17, and you read how, you know, Goliath was cursing the armies of Israel and blah, blah, blah. And so uh, Jesse, David's father, sent him out uh, to bring some food to his brothers. I think three of his brothers was a part of that uh, Israelite army. So he sent them out. He sent him out to take them some food. So when he got there, he heard this giant cursing the armies of Israel, and he started inquiring, well, what's going to happen to the man that handles this thing? And uh, Eliab, his older brother, heard him talking to the, some of these soldiers, and the Bible says he became furious. I mean, it just he, he just became, he was beside himself. Now, here's the thing. Why? Why was Eliab so angry with David just because he was asking what's going to happen to the guy that takes care of this giant? Why was he so angry? Why did that bother him so much? Why was he slandering David the way that he was because of a question? Well, again, it goes deeper than that question. You know, I think the problem with David and his brothers began before David even uh, came into this world. Let me, let me show you what I mean. If you go to the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel uh, chapter, I believe it's chapter 16. I'm going to start reading at verse 10. Now, le let me just give you a, a little background. Um, Saul had messed up. God had decided he was no longer going to be king. So he said, I want you to go to Jesse and I want you to choose me out a king from the house of Jesse. So let me start at verse 10, chapter 16. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel and said, and Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord have not chosen any of these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are here all thy children? And he said, there remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was, now listen to this. Now he was ready, which means he was a redhead. And he was with her of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now, I thought it interesting when I read this, first of all, that David was not invited to be there with the other brethren. So quite naturally, being the inquisitive person that I am, I asked, why? Why was David not there with the other brethren? He was, he was a part of the family, supposedly just like everyone else. Why did Jesse purposely not invite uh, David to that meeting because now the Bible tells us clearly when they heard that the prophet Samuel uh, was coming to town even the elders the one who would sit around and give advice and words of wisdom even when they heard that Samuel was coming to town they, they were shaking in their shoes I mean they were literally shaking in their shoes so now you would think that being known that Jesse would have had all of his sons there but no he decided and I, I don't know why, what happened, what the reason was that he decided one son was not going to be there. He was not invited. When you couple that along with the attitude that Eliab had with David, you could see right away that there was some type of tension going on there. So then I asked myself, well, who was the mother of David? Because the Bible does not talk about it. The Bible doesn't talk about who the mother of David was. Did he have the same a mother as the other children did? I mean, it, could this have been the reason that he was not invited initially? Now, you kind of get a clue. And I, and I want to go to this. If you go to uh, the book of Psalm, Psalm chapter, I, I believe it's Psalm chapter 51. Let's go there. I want to read something to you because it kind of gives you a clear picture of what might have been happening. Now, listen to this. Psalm 51, verse 5. It says this, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. What exactly does it mean? Because, you know, theologians would try to uh, say, well, the sin was man, mankind being in sin. Whatever. But that has, no, that has no bearing on, you know, someone committing adultery, probably, and, um, and a child being born. Because listen to what David said. I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin... That, that word sin there means something done illegally did my mother conceive me. So now it sounds to me like David was living in a situation where he was probably, they probably had different mothers and his mother probably 
conceived him and was taken by Jesse to live with them. Now, I want you to get this, talking about blended families. Now, I can't prove this scripturally, so I want to walk lightly with this, but I'm going right by what David said. I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, imagine this. Imagine you know, David feeling this way, David having, you know, having to feel like he was an outcast. I mean, because he already was not invited to the party. Imagine now, uh, the prophet Samuel was sent to your daddy's house because one of the sons is going to be anointed the next king of Israel, and he's not even invited. Why wasn't he? Why wasn't David there? Some say, well, because he was the youngest son. Well, okay, so the young if he was the youngest son, the, the next youngest son was there. All of the other seven brothers was there. What, did that, what does that have to do with David not being there? There had to be another reason. Now, if you go to Psalm chapter 69, and let's look at verse 7. And this gives you a better idea of what some of the things might have been going on. Listen to what David said. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame has covered my face. I am, now listen, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. D did y'all get this? David was living with something that was eating him from the inside out. David was living with a situation where his own brothers did not like him. His own brothers did not respect him. And listen, you cannot get rid of family drama if one of the parents is showing deference over the other. And I want to say this to some of you because some of you may be in this situation right now. You need to be sensitive to how what you are saying to other children may be shaping their destiny. You need to be sensitive to that. It's not the child's fault that they are uh, in a situation like that. You know, I realized, you know, early on in my marriage to Jam that her daughter Janelle was not of my lineage at all, but it was my job to make her feel that she was just as important as my other four children was. Janelle has been with me since she was four years old. I love Janelle as much as I do all of my children. But now, again, as the parent, you have to make sure that you are bringing that type of unity and showing that type of love. But now, if you're in a situation where you are made to feel as though you are less than someone else because you may have a different mother or you are your mother has a tainted reputation, so somehow that affects who you are, then yes, that may impact your destiny. And imagine this same type of thing you know, went down through David's children. That's why you often hear me say, you be careful what you say and do around your children because you just may be shaping their destiny with your words and with your deeds. And David was in a situation, and thank God that God looked at David's heart. Now, even though the other bro brethren were supposedly the chosen ones, Eliab, the oldest one, big and tall and, you know, looking like a soldier, looking like Saul probably, you know, big and tall, I'm sure Samuel figured, well, this must be the one, but God didn't choose any of them. Why? Because the Bible is clear about this. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Believers, listen, we've got to learn to judge people not by so much what they look like. I remember situations in high school where I was hanging out with the girls that was not so popular. Either they were overweight or they didn't look as good as some of the other girls. Well, they always flocked around me. You want to know why? Because it didn't matter to me what they looked like. It didn't matter, it didn't matter to me, you know, um, how heavy or small they were. All that mattered to me was I enjoyed being around them because they kept it 100. They kept it real. And let me tell you something. That is one of the things that attracted me so much about Darlene. I love being around people who are real, who are humble, you know, who love God, who love themselves, and then is willing to love you to the fullest. They're not moved and they're not intimidated by what other people are saying and doing. They are focused on what they're supposed to be focused on. And as leaders in your home, let me say this to you clearly. Your behavior may impact the destiny and the legacy of you as well as your children. So thank you for giving me this time with you. I wanted to share that with you because that thing was in my spirit. And, uh, and I want you to always be mindful that your behavior really does impact the future of your children. Watch what you say around them. Watch, you know, the behavior that, that you... Um, 
that you show around your children because it impacts them. You may not see it now, but good behavior the same way impacts your children. And I, I love it now when I see my children saying to my grandchildren some of the exact same things I said to them. Why? Because the Bible is clear. Train up a child in the way they should go and when they are older, they won't depart from it. Thank you for giving me this time with you. I love you with the love of the Lord. Until next week, my prayer is that the Lord God will bless you real good. Thank you for joining Words to Inspire You with your host, Pastor John Baysmore. Words to Inspire You is a production of Restoration Christian Ministries Incorporated. Teaching the word, living by faith, growing in grace. We thank you for watching this broadcast and pray that you will continue to partner with us. We invite you to join us again for our next program as we present Words to Inspire You, a time of refreshing.